to the back side, but keep it in front of you. Keep your pen where you can grab it. A little bit later, we're going to ask you to do something else. Here are the Tom Rhodes questions. So the, and you have to stand up and answer the question. Please do not yell it out. So several weeks ago, in the first talk I gave in this series, we read a verse from Mark 8, 29. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Peter answered and said, you are. It's a two-word answer. Who would like to answer it for the prize? Right back here first. Please stand up if you have the answer. Come on up, man. Come on up. Ah, uh, yeah. John, I've been to Cesaro, Philippi. What's that? Springs. I've been there. You've been there? You've been where he said that? Exactly. Well, there you go, man. Take somebody with you next time. That would be great. Thank you very much. And I know you had it down here. We have another one if you're quick enough, Sean, if you're quick enough. Okay, the second question is, I said, and I say this all the time, the Christian life, you got to stand, the Christian life is not difficult, it is, got to stand up. Impossible. What? Impossible. Possible. You get it because you went by the, okay, I got a, a magnet pickup tool. This baby, right. no, if you don't want it, give it to me, I'll take it. Nice. Tom Rhodes only gives good gifts most of the time. Last question. You have to stand. If you don't stand and yell it out, you will break out with a fever. All right, here we go. How many, got to stand, how many books in the Bible? Back here. How many? I can't hear you. Come on up. I could hear you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you got to be quick, man. We're wasting time right here, okay? Come up here on the stage. Come up. You had food in your mouth? Yes. You got it on your face now, man. What's up? What's, I'm just kidding you. What's your name? Kyle? Kyle. John Tolson. You get a book, Decision Points by George Bush. If you don't like the him, find a Republican. We got a few of them in here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well. I'm sorry we couldn't meet last week. If your back is to me and you want to remain that way, fine, but you can also scoot it around. This talk today is very important, and you'll see as we move through it and go up to the 1 o'clock hour when we try to finish. Um, I really encourage you. You don't have to take every word down, but I encourage you with a paper that's on the table or some paper you brought or on your phone, jot it down. Jot a note down. We don't have photographic memories. If you do, I want to meet you. All right, let me pray and then we'll get going. Father, we thank you so much for never pulling us together like this to waste our time. You have a purpose. Everything you do in our lives and around us, even when we're not aware of it, has a purpose. So I pray today that we would be tuned in to you. And the words that I say would strike home in our hearts where we need it. In Jesus' name, amen. So a young woman was driving a red sports car. She zipped in front of an elderly lady driving a brand new Mercedes. <clears throat> she took the parking spot for which the lady, the elder lady, had been waiting the young woman smiled and looked at the lady, the elderly lady in the Mercedes and said, that's what happens when you're young and quick. Ever had that happen to you? I had that happen the other day, and I gave him the Hawaiian good luck sign. Anyway, then, <laughs> then, to the surprise of the young woman, the elderly lady backed up her Mercedes, put it in forward, and crashed into her car. And not only that, <laughs> but she backed it up again and crashed into it again. Then the elderly lady rolled down her window, looked at the young gal in the red sports car and said, that's what happens when you're old and rich. <laughs> there you go, baby. So here's the point of that. Sometimes my jokes have no points, but this one has a point. Point is, if you have Jesus in your life, you are free and dangerous. Free and dangerous. So with that in mind, let's kick it off and get going. So Mark chapter 8, if you look at the screen, it'll be up there because most of you don't bring your Bibles to this deal. But we all do what we do here based on the book. And so Jesus 
and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, where you have been. On the way, he asked them, who do men say that I am, or who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others still one of the prophets. But then he zooms in, not only on them, but through this, on you and me this, this noonday, but who do you say that I am? And your answer and response to that question has eternal implications. You've probably heard this verse before many times. Maybe you heard it taught on, preached on. You've read it in your own Bible, perhaps. You've heard people quote it. But how you answer that question does have eternal consequences. So I want to review briefly the consequences we looked at last week without talking about each one of them. Number one, your answer will determine your relationship with God. Two, your answer will determine whether you will have forgiveness of guilt and shame in your life or not. Your answer determines your capacity for daily living. Your answer determines what kind of person you are becoming and how you will live your life. Your answer determines your capacity to really care and love others. Your answer determines your courage to die. Your answer determines your willingness to believe the Bible and what it says and try to do it. Your answer determines where you will spend eternity. That's what's at stake. A lot of, a lot of stuff there at stake. And I think a lot of times we are familiar with certain verses, certain, first, uh, certain thoughts in the Bible, and the familiar becomes old to us and stale. Oh, I heard that before. Somebody talked. Listen, fellas, just for one 20, 30-minute period, tune in as though you've never heard this before. Come at it fresh and see what he wants to say to you. So the first thing I want to point out before we really dig into the meat of this is, is we need to look at the claims of Jesus Christ, the claims of Christ. And Christ made these claims, and either they're true or they're not true. Either he was a fake or he was for real. So, for example, the claims of Christ. In John chapter number 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Definite article, the, not a, the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's either true or a lie from the pit of hell. In John 8, it says, then they answered him, where is your father? He says, you do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And what he's saying there is what we said last week. There's no way we get a relationship with a holy God if we don't have access through who Jesus is and what he's done. See, I got a backup here. Some of you saw this drop. I'm ready, baby, right here. But also, Sean, you get an extra door prize next time. <laughs> but thank you very much. And so what he's saying here is your access to a holy God is through Jesus Christ. So then he says in John 10, 10, I and the Father are the same. We're one. Either that's true or it's false. You say, I don't know if I believe that. Start looking at the implications if you reject that. If you reject that, then according to the Scripture anyway, you have no access to get to a holy God by getting your sins forgiven and guilt gone because God, a holy God can't have in relationship to him anyone less than 100% perfect. You and I can't be 100% perfect, but Jesus, who was perfect, makes us perfect and gives us the covering, the ticket, so to speak, to get into a holy God. And that's where religions fall short. Religions do not make you holy. They give you a set of rules, and you can spend your whole life working your butt off trying to keep those rules, but it won't get you one inch closer to God. So, how about his life? Well, he was perfect. If you look at 1 Peter, he never sinned, the Scripture says, nor ever deceived anyone. How about Hebrews 4.15? The scripture says there, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we did, yet he did not sin. It's hard to even conceive of somebody not sinning. He never sinned. Why? Because he was God in a body. God doesn't sin. So we need to understand who he was. He was also authoritative. 
In other words, when he spoke, people didn't sleep. When he spoke, people listened. So if you look, for example, <clears throat> at uh, John 7.15, the people were surprised when they heard him. How does he know so much when he hasn't been trained? Isn't that something? Then, not only that, but he's powerful. So if you look, for example, in the Gospel of John, you see in which one of my favorite Gospels, I have the privilege over the years of speaking and teaching all 21 chapters. It takes four years to go through it, and I've done that, I think, four times over the last bunch of years. But in John 2, he turns the water to wine. John 4, he heals the official son who was 20 miles away, and the official came and said, my son's about to die. He said, go home, your son lives. The official goes home, and his son is alive, 20 miles away. He heals a cripple who's been, who's been, who's been crippled for 38 years, and he gets up and walks. He feeds 5,000 people with a little kid's sack lunch, but it really wasn't 5,000 because they only mentioned the men in the Scripture. They didn't count the women and children. There's probably like 20,000. And so then we see him walking on water, John 9. He heals a man blind. He raises a man from the dead, Lazarus. So, why is he doing all this? Well, if you've read your Bible, you would know. At the end of John, it tells the purpose. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in the book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So, in the Gospel of John, through his words... What he said and his works, he was trying to demonstrate not only to people then, but of all time, I am the Son of God. I'm the real deal. Now, you and I, in order for that to have any impact on us, have to come to grips with whether you believe that or not. And by the way, the Scripture does say we live by faith, but it's not a blind Kierkegaardian leap into nothingness. It's a faith based on facts. But there's more than that, too. And so we see here that he not only is powerful, but he also is unique in the sense that he was born to die. So if you look at Matthew 16, 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests, the Jewish folks, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. This is exactly what happened. He tipped them off what was going to happen. It had happened. You say, I don't know if I believe that. Well, go to, do what, was George Washington, do you believe George Washington was the first president of the United States? Well, with all the revision of history now, who knows what happened. But anyway, <laughs> if you believe that, have you read the documents or just some history book? You can get documents that were written during the time that Jesus lived, died, rose from the dead that verify this person, Jesus. Then you don't believe that? Go to that. Then come back to this if, that, if that's what you need. So we need to understand that. How about his resurrection? Let's look at 1 Corinthians. And I do need my glasses now. I passed on to you what was most important, what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said, Old Testament. He was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. And so many of those prophecies about what Jesus was going to be like, what he did, why he came, and all that, were written in the Scripture seven to 800 years before it ever happened. Well, that's just luck. Sure. All those unbelievable list of prophecies. You find out if a prophecy is true or not, does it come true? Is it realized? Does it really happen? All those things happen. Now, I don't know about you, but that grips me. I mean, that says something to me that's absolutely uh, profound for my own faith and life. So Chip Ingram, what a great writer, and hopefully you've uh, learned to read his books and writings, but he said this, if Jesus Christ didn't die, he didn't rise. If he didn't rise, he's not God. He's a liar and a fake. So we got to do business with that because it has eternal consequences. Michelangelo said this, if Mick, or he, it was said about him, if Michelangelo were to enter our living room, we could, would rise to meet him. 
But if Jesus Christ were to enter, we would fall down and worship him. He is more than a model or a teacher. He is God in a body and reigning in charge, Lord. Anything less will not cut it. What's another, what's another thought on this? Well, George Barna, one of the great researchers in our country on trends in the faith and church and so forth, said people are more interested in faith and religion than they are Jesus. You leave Jesus out, I hear people all the time, well, it, it's God. I believe in God, but it's just Jesus I have a hard time with. Or, you, or, or they'll say this about, well, you know, he's really a spiritual person. Let me tell you, you better be careful of that one. You, I know couples that have gotten married and everybody, well, he's spiritual. He's spiritual. And they get married and about two months later, they, they're not married anymore. He was spiritual. What happened? You better investigate that. If you've got kids getting ready to get married, you better get them somebody good to do their premarital counseling. If they come to me, we're going to dig right into that. Why do you hook up with somebody that's three bricks short of a forward load but looks real good out front? That, that's not smart. And some of you have had kids that have made that decision, and they've had to live, and you've had to be impacted by their mistake. It's not worth it. Spiritual. Throw the word out. Use the word faith. Relationship with him. What's another, what's another uh, way to understand if, if Jesus was real? How about changed lives? Let me tell you, you can, you can argue with this. You cannot argue with a man's life who's been changed through Christ. You can't argue with that. You can, you can argue till you're blue in the face, but the guy said, <laughs> like the man they healed in chapter 9 who was blind, and the, and the Pharisees came at him, bombarded him. Who did this? Who said this? How did you get up and get your sight again? He said, all I can tell you is he put a little mud in the ground. He spit on it. He stuck him in my eyes, and I can see. That's, they ask him, well, let me tell you, he put, I'm telling you what he did. If you know him for real, you know that you know that you know, and you don't have to prove it to anybody. You're free, and you're dangerous. And let me tell you, there's a freedom in being free. And there are many of us in this room, perhaps, we made a commitment to Christ a long time ago. We sang kumbaya, threw a stick on a fire at a camp deal, said yes to Jesus, but it's made no difference in our lives, or he's been pushed off to the side over the years. Well, we have a remedy for that. Just hang in. Don't leave yet. What he offers, what does he offer us? What no one offers, he offers us pardon. He offers us peace inside and peace with God and the potential with peace for one another. He offers us power. He said, no, the Christian life is impossible, but when I come in you, I will live through you and enable you day by day, minute by minute, to do what I want you to do and live the way I want you to live. And I will transform your life in the process. Now, some of you say, I don't believe that stuff. If you don't believe that stuff, you haven't tried it. Jesus does what he says he'll do. The scripture says, God, Jesus in a body, cannot lie. So either you just don't know or you're ignorant or you haven't tried it. it ain't, it's not on him. It's on us. And he gives us purpose. I was talking to a buddy yesterday about somebody who was struggling in their life, and I said, the guy doesn't have any purpose. He gets up. He's made his money. Now he's going. He's got a place here. He's got a place in the mountains and out at the beach. He's playing golf five days a week. He's in the back of the country club playing cards with his buddy, farting around and telling ugly jokes. What a life. Don't you envy that? Let me tell you, that's an empty life. If that man doesn't have Christ and he can enjoy some of those things and be grateful for those things, but there's something way more important than that that God's left him here for. Why is it, the guy said one day to me, hey, your hair's kind of getting gray. And what says, so's yours. <laughs> and I said, do you know why God lets your hair get gray? Because he's trying to warn you, you don't have much time left. You get up in the morning, man, mm, back stiff and leg stiff and what, where's that coming from? God's trying to warn you. You don't have a lot of time left. And you don't have to have gray hair, you young guys, do not have a lot of time left. It goes fast. 
and we never know when we're going to go. So here's the, here's the meat of what I want to get to today. In light of all that, that Jesus claims to be the Son of God, and all the other things that I've indicated, now I want to talk about what is the most important response you and I can make in light of that truth, the truth of Christ. So here's the stuff I want to get after today. Number one, if you want to make the proper response, everyone has to do this for this to mean anything, you've got to receive Christ into your life. That's why every time we meet, I encourage those who have not done that to do that. So he says in John 1, 12, yet to all who received him, to those he, who believed in his name, in other words, who he was, he gave the right to become a child of God. People say, well, everybody's a child of God. No, they're not. We're all created by God, but we're all not children of God. Go to Genesis 3. We have been separated from God and have to be brought back into a relationship with God. And when we come to Christ, he gets us back in a right relationship with him. And therefore, because we have been adopted, the Bible says, back into his family. Only way you get in. So you, re you receive him. And then if you look at John 3, 16, powerful verse, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life begins now with a quality of life, and it lasts forever, a quantity. It's not something, well, in the by and by, when I get there, no. It begins the moment you receive Christ, the moment. So you got to receive him. you got to believe. Now let's go to the second one. What are the results of that? If you came to Christ years ago, last two weeks ago in our meeting, or today, you're forgiven. Every sin you've ever committed was gone. Two, you now have a right relationship with the God of the universe. Three, you had, the Bible says, all the benefits he wants you to have now and in the future to live this faith. Look at Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 9. And look at the list of benefits it lays out there that are yours if you know Christ. And if you are not experiencing those gifts and you are a Christian, then you need to open up your Bible and fall on your knees and say, Lord, make these come alive in me. I don't want to be a mediocre follower of Jesus. We, we've already got too many of those. He also gives us adventure. I'm telling you, the greatest adventure of my life over all these years, now that I've turned 56, yeah, how you, I know you believe that one, a week ago or so, has been following him. It hadn't always been easy. There's been a heartbreak in my life. But, man, the adventure and the positive things have out. People said, you know, man, if you'd have been in business, you could have a lot of money. I kind of believe that. You know, I just got enough manipulation in me and, and stuff. I think I could have probably had a pile. But that's not the way I was led because I was led inside of me. God said, you got to do what, what the most important thing is, and that is get people to me. Because that's what's going to last for eternity. All the other, you ever see a, 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 a van pulling a U-Haul up behind it? No, we don't, we don't, can't pile our stuff up and take it with us. Hold things lightly. The third thing I want us to understand is we have to ask ourselves the question, are we dead or alive? The Scripture says in Ephesians 2, 1, it's, you got it on the screen right there. It says, once you were dead, Paul talking about the people in Ephesus and all of us who don't know Christ because of your disobedience and your many sins. To be dead means spiritually you can't respond to the life of God unless God comes along through His power and Spirit and works in your head and your heart and your mind and gives you the want to and the desire to want to trust him with your life. Some guys say to me, well, I'll just come to, to, I'll come to Jesus when I'm ready. Ooh, you be a very, you, let me tell you, that ain't going to happen. You don't come, and come to him when you're good and ready and for your convenience. You will only come if he opens up your heart and gives you the ability to believe. If you came to Christ, it's because he helped you. Well, I wasn't even aware of that. Well, that's the way it works. So Jesus, now listen to this. This is so important. Jesus wants you to come to Christ, and while you're in Dallas or wherever you're going to live the rest of your life, he wants you to be fully alive. 
He doesn't want you just to limp along. He doesn't want you to just say, well, my, my sins are forgiven and I'll just do the best I can. Of all people on the planet that ought to be fully alive, who ought to be the greatest thinkers on the planet, ought to be the greatest doers in this city for Christ, it ought to be men fully alive through Christ. Can you describe yourself that way? Would people describe you like that? I'm not talking about some jackleg fanatic beating people over the head with the Bible. I'm talking about people who have a vibrant life and personality and aliveness because Christ, the life Christ, lives in you. Look what it says in, in uh, Romans 6, 4. It's on the screen. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, and here it is, now we also may live new lives, full of life. Full of life. Are you full of life or just full of the food you just had or full of something else? <laughs> we probably all have a little bit of that. <laughs> I, I love this story. I've told it many times. Some of for you would be new. Some of you would be a refresher. But there's a great point I want to make in it. There was a great uh, tightrope walker named Blondin. And years ago, what he would do, he would put a tightrope from the Canadian side to the Niagara Falls on the American side, and he would get on that thing, and he'd walk over. So one day he did it. He walked a tightrope, got on the other side, the crowd, 10,000 people, Blondin, Blondin, Blondin. I mean, they were going crazy. He quiets them down. Do you believe in me? We believe, we believe, we believe. He said, I'm getting ready to go back to the other side. But when I go back, I'm going to take one of you on my back with me. Who would like to ride over? <laughs> About an hour goes by, and finally, out of 10,000, one guy said, I'll do it, and stepped forward. Got on his back. Three and a half hours later, he made it to the other side. So you say, what's the point of that? Listen, here is the point of that. This is so critical, fellas. Today, 10,000 people stood there and say, we believe, we believe, but only one accepted. We say, I believe, I believe in Jesus, but there's no change. I believe, I believe, well, maybe next year, Lord. I believe, I, well, that's just some people, the way they do the Christian life, that's not me. Listen, what we're devoid of in our day and time is not people who say they believe in Jesus, but we're devoid of people who are committed disciples. Whole big difference in people that believe in Jesus and those on the other side who are committed, surrenders, disciples to Jesus and say, take me, I'm your man. If we don't get some more of those, it's not going to be good. So which one are you, which camp are you in? You say, well, how do you get to be a committed disciple? How do you do that? Well, I'll get into that in just a moment. Stick with me. So here's number five point. Jesus wants you and me to be a significant part of the, his plan to change the planet. That's what he wants all of us to be if, as followers of Jesus. Are you a part of the movement? You say, I don't even know what the movement is. That's very sad. But anyway, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, it's not just get your ticket punched so you can go to heaven. It's him working through you to change Dallas, the state, the country, the world. Do you have a world vision? Bill Bright, who's with the Lord years ago, wanted to win students to Christ in this country. He started a thing called Campus Crusade for Christ. Millions of students through one man who was a businessman. And came to Christ and gave his life in mobilizing people to bring students to Christ. One man, just a man. So what's your resume going to look like when you get up there if you make it? Is he going to say, man, you mean you spent, you came to know me and you spent 50, 60, 70, 80 years, 20 years, whatever. You got nothing to show for it? The scripture says, we will be known by the fruit that we bear. All of us are to bear spiritual fruit. So where do you get the game plan? Well, let me give you one game plan I had really not looked at before in this way, but it's the thing you recite at church often, the Lord's Prayer. It is a prayer to change the planet. Think about it. 
Pray like this, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom, your rule, your reign. Come, your will be done. Where? On earth. In Dallas, in your home, on your block, in your work. No place is off limits. That's why we're here. Did they tell you that in the church where you go? Did they prepare you for this? Did they have courses and classes to mobilize you as a head of a corporation, how to take that corporation for Christ? See, that's why we're here. We're not here to waste time and take up space. Then he goes on and he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you, this is the end of it. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others your trespasses or sins, neither will the Father forgive you. See, so you got any relationship? You're holding back on forgiving somebody. You don't know what they did to me. I don't care what they did. Probably screwed around, did something really bad. But he said, if you forget, if you have been forgiven and you've experienced that, you have a duty, not because you feel like it, but because I told you so, because now you're under new orders. You're under my command. When you come to Jesus, he's the leader, not you or me. But boy, we don't like that, do we? I, well, I kind of like to run the show. After all he's done for us, we're quibbling over who's going to run the show. That's, that just doesn't make sense to me. Oh, there's a lot more. Number six, so where do you start? How where do you start? You start with your own personal life and living this thing and following him. You start with your home as a husband, as a dad, as a granddad. You start in your workplace. A guy asked me yesterday, he was, I was meeting with three guys, one from Atlanta, two guys from, one from um, North Georgia, and then another one from Naples. And these guys are, are working in countries around the world, Muslim countries, and hundreds of thousands of people through their work are coming to Christ. Muslims. Three men. One was a businessman. He built golf courses, and Jesus changed his life on a golf course one day. And now all he does is give his life to reach people over there. That's where his call is. Your workplace. And so my buddy from Atlanta said, do you know many guys in Dallas who have either, they, they're well off or, or they have done real well um, that really understand and have a vision for using their platform where they are and who they know, et cetera, to make a difference for Christ? I said, I know a handful, but not many. I, I was sorry to have to report that. He says it's the same thing in Atlanta. So, fellas, when's it going to change for you? Are we going to drag our sorry butts into heaven and say, well, Jesus, thank for what you did for us? And he's going to say, well, I did do something pretty magnificent. Obviously, you didn't understand the depth of it. You didn't understand it. You didn't deserve it. But I gave it to you anyway. How about your relationships? All that is where you start. Number seven, what is the basic, what is the basic focus of the impact? So if you look at, they're just a couple. I mean, there's a lot of things we're supposed to do and how we live and treat people and all that, but they're just basically two things. He said when he called his disciples in Matthew 4, 19, he said, I'm calling you to make you fishers of people or fishers of men. You fish for fish. That's your trade. That's how you make your money in Dallas today. But that is only how you eat. Your call is to get people to Jesus. So my wife and I are in Charleston, South Carolina, New Year's Eve to perform a wedding with two folks that are going to both, they're both going to be doctors. They're now in their residencies. And I mean a sharp young couple. We had the privilege over the months of doing their premarital counseling and they wanted to get married in Charleston. That was one of their favorite places. And the family and all their friends came over. But on Saturday before the, the, so that evening for the, for the uh, wedding that I was going to do, uh, my wife said, let's get one of those bikes. The guys pull you around the little cart and you look at what downtown Charleston's like. It, 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 I love Charleston. It's really neat. So he was driving us around. His name was Jackson. He had calves like that. Went to college somewhere there. Great personality. Sharp guy. So finally, we said after about 45 minutes, Jackson, we got to get back. 
we got, we got to get ready for that wedding tonight. So he turns it around, takes us back, and I said, Jackson, pull right over here on the side. Don't go right up into the driveway of the hotel yet. Because I got the nod. I got the nod internally. I'm supposed to say something to this guy about Jesus. And you think I'm the only one that can do it? You can do it. And he wants you to do it if you know him. So what did I say? He said, Jackson, turn around. So he swivels around on his chair, <laughs> on his bike seat. Might have been a little awkward for him. But anyway, he turns around. Now he's looking at Punk and myself. I said, Jackson, I may never see you again. But I want to ask you a question. You're going up the street and you drop us off. You're going to take a right. Is that the way? Yeah, that's the way I go. He said, what if you go down that street and you get broadsided and you're out? It's over for you. Where are you going? I mean, he sobered up real fast. And he said, real, with a quivering voice, heaven, heaven, I hope. And then he started to cry. And Punky said, why are you crying? And he said, well, a month or so ago, my grandmother died. And I love my grandmother. And after you asked that question, I don't know where she is. <clears throat> I said, uh, would you like to know how you can know if you're going to make it or not? And also how you can know how to live differently now? He said, who wouldn't? So I said, Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead. And he said, I want to come into your life. You need to receive me, and I'll forgive you. And all the things we've talked about here, it, it lasted three minutes. I said, would you like to make that decision to do that? I wasn't pushing him. I was talking just like this. And he's still weeping. He said, yes. So I grabbed his hand. Punky grabbed his hand. I said, don't you close your eyes. You look at me, and I want you to pray this prayer out loud where I can hear you and verify it. And he prayed that simple, beautiful little prayer. And Jesus came into his life. He gets off his seat. He hugs my wife. He hugs me. We say goodbye. And I said, give me your address. I'm going to send you some stuff. I mean, five minutes later, he's around the corner somewhere. And he sends a, a text to us and said, this is going to change my life. Thank you. I've never had a bike ride like this before. I sent him a Bible, a four priority book, and a take a knee book. And he got it a week and a half ago. He said, I am so excited. And I told him kind of how to reach each one, where to start. He said, I'm starting tonight. I am so excited, 21 years old. He doesn't have to wait 50 years of his life, waste it before the light comes on. I did that wedding that night. There were eight or ten groomsmen. Beautiful wedding. Two or three hundred people from Dallas. It was a hoopla. Beautiful. We were at the dinner. We're eating. And one of the grooms, I really loved these grooms. They were great. One of them was a six-foot-eight guy from Miami. And he came back and was talking to Punk and myself. He said, well, really great to meet you, guy. Da, da, da. I said, well, I need to get your address and so forth. I got the call. I just said to myself, am I supposed to say something, Lord? And when he gives me the nod, I better not walk away from that. You say, well, you're a preacher. You know what? You're a child, a man of God, if you know Jesus. You have the same call on you that I have on me. Let's get that straight. So I said, let's go back here. There was a band, a lot of noise. So we went back. I said, tell me about your life. Tell me where you're headed. What do you want to do? I said, all right, let me ask you something. When it's all over, where are you going? He said, heaven. I said, how do you know? Well, I tried to be good. And I said, you can't be good enough. You need some help. Jesus came to rescue you. Well, you got, and then he gets into these, 28 years old. Well, you got all these other religions. I said, don't give me that crap. That's obviously you haven't studied those religions. A bunch of rules. And try to do the best you can and hope you make it. What if I could tell you you can make it? Told him about Christ, just like Jackson. Well, he's still hesitating. I've never done this before. So we're sitting just like this. Good-looking kid, six foot eight, good basketball player. So I took the back of my hand. I can't do it here. But I hit him in the chest like this. I said, let me ask you something. Do you have the guts to ask Christ into your life? He said, I do. I said, pray this prayer. He came to Christ. It all depends on the person. If they're bigger than you, you might not ought to do that. 
those two people are going to be in heaven. I go, I go this weekend, like I told you two weeks ago, to, to Miami. I'm performing a wedding for a buddy of mine who's from Orlando. The, the lady's a doctor in Miami. And I led her to Christ a week and a half ago when we was, I was doing some premarital counseling in Orlando for an afternoon. It makes all the difference in the world and everything. The second thing is he calls us to make disciples. Some of you have been around here a long time, said, man, you talk about that all the time. That's, you know why? Because I don't see a whole lot of people doing it. Look at Matthew 28, 19, the last words that came out of Jesus' mouth. He says, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. Make reproducers, not moochers. We got a lot of Christians that mooch all the good stuff in church, mooch all the seminars, move all the Bible study fellowship. We mooch, 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 mooch. But we don't give a whole lot. You got the diagram? Okay, this is one buddy of mine. And there's a few more circles than all to be up to the outer edge. He's here today. He is in the middle. He started about five years ago taking a few guys through the four priorities, telling them, when you go through it, when we're done, then you got to take somebody. You see what's happening in about five years? That's supposed to be every one of us. That's standard issue. It's not a spiritual gift. It is a command by Christ to all Christians. Why aren't you doing that? What's your excuse? Well, you don't know the sin in my life. I, don't, I know the sin in your life. He knows it, and he's already forgiven you. If you're a believer, come on, quit making excuses. Every church ought to be doing that. You in a church that does that? Let's go up and down your pews in your church and say, tell me the man you're working with. Tell me the work, woman you're discipling. And a lot of times in our country, the reason it's not happening in churches is because the pastors aren't doing it. I've interviewed them, some of the great in the country. No, I've never done that. How do you not, how do you skip over that verse? So, the last thing, what, the question is what matters most? And I know I'm going a couple minutes over. What matters most? Look at John 17, 3. The only definition in the Bible of eternal life. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent. Eternal life is a relationship. The Christian life is not about rules and going through this rigmarole of spiritual stuff. It is about a relationship with the God of the universe through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. And a lot of times I've wondered, why do so many men seem to miss the point? You know, they're Christians. They ask Christ in their life. But they don't, their hearts don't burn within them. And their desire to want to follow him and do whatever he asked them to do. What do we, how do we get over that? Let me tell you how you get over it. You get over it by getting on your knees every day and opening his book up and opening up your life to him and say, Lord, change me. Help me to become more like you. One of the reasons a lot of people don't get anything out of the Bible is because they don't know the author. If you don't know the author, you're not going to get much out of it. Well, i got to close this down. I have to skip a couple really good things here. Mm. So here's, here's going to be my challenge for you today. If you've never asked Christ into your life and been forgiven and let him come into your life, with your eyes wide, like we did two weeks ago, right now, I just want you to silently pray. I don't want to embarrass you. This prayer between you and the Lord. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Come on my life now. Clean me up. Forgive me. And from this day forward, help me to become the man you want me to be. Now, gentlemen, you need, when you come to Christ, either now or two weeks ago or way in the past, you need to understand something. There is a war going on in the world. You have come to know Jesus. It is nuts. And there is a real enemy that doesn't want you to come to him, doesn't want you to lead people to him, doesn't want you to disciple. There is a war going on in our culture. You are, we, it seems like we're trapped. We're not trapped. We're the only people that know how to get out of here. 
but we are in a war. But in this war, Jesus said, follow me, and I'm going to use you in the midst of this war to get people to me. This is what you're here for. So, the question is, if you, if you, sign, if you ask Christ in last, two weeks ago or today, please, before you leave, if you'll turn that card over and just put a check mark. That's all I want you to do. Well, I don't want anybody to see me checking that thing. Are you kidding me? So Jesus comes, lives and dies, and gives his life for you for everything he wants to give you, and you can't make a check mark? He said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you. We need to be standing up instead of hiding and being timid. Like I said last time, real men are men that know Jesus and follow him. Okay, here's the last, here's the last, here's the last thing. And I'm going to read this and then we'll pray. My challenge to you is this. <clears throat> I must surrender my fascination with myself to a more worthy preoccupation with the character and the purposes of God. I am not the point. He is. I exist for him. He does not exist for me. And until we get that straight, we're missing something. So here's my challenge. If you want to surrender your life to him, and you may not understand all of what that means. But if you're willing to say, Lord, I want to give you myself in a way I haven't before, all I am, all I have, everything, I want to be your man and help me figure out what that is. I want you to stand up right now. And don't do it because anything. Stand up if you want to do that. Now, there are enough men here to turn this city upside down. You need help? That's why I'm here. You say, John, I need help with this. I need help with that. How do you do this? Oh, you got, I've been here 19 years. I got an office right around the corner. I got a phone. We have an email. I always say, come, here I am. How can I help you? Let's get going. Look in this room and know the people around you at your table. Before you leave, you ought to know who their names are and what the deal is. Your life will never be the same if you're serious about this, and I trust that you are. So, Jesus, go with us now. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you and to know that you've come after us, and now we belong to you. Now, go with us, Lord, and help us to become the men that you've always created us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate it.
Change, change, change.